The following story takes place between the years 1154 and 1272. In today's video, we look at the Plantagenet dynasty and its multiple twists and turns. If you need some context, you may want to check out the previous episodes of our series. Otherwise, get ready to delve into devious political conspiracies and betrayals, and also plenty of action, with battles abroad and rebellions at home. There's a lot to get through, so let's begin. At the end of the previous episode, we saw how the son of Geoffrey of Anjou and Empress Matilda, Henry II, gained the English throne and founded the Plantagenet dynasty, which would guide England's destiny for the following 330 years. For far too long. During the English anarchy, many earls had become strong in their castles and were no longer really subject to the king, while Scotland and Wales had conquered some English territories. Therefore, Henry's top priority was to fight pretty much everyone and re-establish his authority. It is often said of King Henry II that he was merciless because he expelled several earls from their feuds to replace them with his loyal buddies. You're fired. Thanks to his double inheritance, combined with his marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine, heir to the huge Duchy of Aquitaine in France, Henry II gained control over the Angevin Empire, which comprised all the territory you can see on this map. His domain spanned from Scotland to the Pyrenees, making him one of Europe's most powerful rulers of the age. The problem was that this was not a unified kingdom in any way, shape or form, as each territory had its own language, laws, institutions and currency. To make matters worse, Henry only spoke French and needed an interpreter to understand and communicate in English. That's probably why he spent most of his reign at Rouen in Normandy and Angers in Anjou. In this, he was similar to most of his Norman predecessors and also several successors. They didn't like spending too much time in England because they said it was too cold, and also they probably wanted to stay as far away as possible from Manchester. As we said, Henry's wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, was an extremely important and interesting figure, but then again, Eleanors are usually pretty great people. By the time she married Henry, she was already an experienced political beast, having been the former Queen of France, as well as a patron of culture and lover of poetry, as Eleanors are also pretty classy. Now she also became a mother, giving birth to four children. The eldest was Henry the Young King, who married Princess Margaret, daughter of King Louis VII of France. Thanks to this, the English king gained access to the territory of Vexen. After him came Richard, Geoffrey and John. Apart from the boys, they also had several daughters, who married powerful men. In addition, Henry also had several bastard children, most notably, albeit not entirely confirmed, with Alice, Countess of Vexen, and daughter of the King of France. This was quite the scandal at the time, because she was barely a child and engaged to his own son, Richard. But apart from Alice, Henry had several mistresses, including Rosamund Clifford, a beautiful noblewoman, about whom there are plenty of colourful legends that we unfortunately don't have time to get into. A sex scandal has brought in reporters from around the world. Henry also concerned himself with law and order. Until that time, the prevailing feudal law dictated that the lord of each estate resolved any cases affecting his vassals. But Henry sought more power to decide over certain matters, and to this effect, he established royal courts in each county, with sheriffs being in charge of bringing the convicts to justice. Years later, in 1188, Ranulf de Glanville drafted the Treatise of Glanville, which codified English law. So boring. And now we must talk about the problems that Henry II had with a key figure, Thomas Becket. It all began in 1162, with the death of Theobald of Beck, Archbishop of Canterbury, whereupon Henry decided to appoint his Chancellor, Thomas Becket, who had been Theobald's protégé, as new Archbishop. They had always been very close friends, but as soon as Becket put on the mitre, something inside him changed radically. Nobody really knows why. He left behind the ostentatious lifestyle he had led until then and became very austere. Next, he began challenging the king on certain important issues. For starters, Henry wanted the Church of England to be subject to him, so he could decide on ecclesiastical appointments and that kind of thing, but Becket told him to go fly a kite. The reason why this was important is because back then, any crime committed by a member of the clergy was judged by an ecclesiastical court instead of a civil one, and they were far more lenient, and also didn't dole out physical punishments, let alone executions. 
But the problem was that nearly one-sixth of the population belonged to some sort of religious order and, therefore, the king didn't have much power over a large number of people. So, the first dispute between Henry and Becket was for this reason. To make matters worse, Becket then refused to give the king a share of the church's revenues, and things turned pretty sour between them. <laughs> With this, we reach the year 1164, when Henry II passed the Constitutions of Clarendon, which formalised the king's supremacy and authority over the church. Many members of the clergy saw the writing on the wall and submitted to the king, but Becket continued to oppose him, so Henry had him arrested. Thomas Becket was then imprisoned and accused of several crimes, including misappropriation of funds and trying to appeal to the Pope without the king's consent. However, the Archbishop managed to escape and flee to France, gaining the protection of King Louis VII. From this new base, he contacted Pope Alexander III, but he wasn't able to provide much aid to Becket, as Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa had expelled him from Rome. With Becket out of his hair, at least for now, Henry went on a military spree. In 1166, he gained control over Brittany, and in 1169, he began the conquest of Ireland, an enterprise that would be prolonged over many centuries. It began with a man who is considered as the greatest traitor in the history of Ireland, the exiled King of Leinster, Dermot McMurrah, who reached a deal with the Earl of Pembroke, Richard de Clare, commonly known as Strongbow, like the cider. In exchange for Richard's help in reclaiming the Irish throne, Dermot would give him the hand of his daughter Aoife and make him his heir. The pair managed to take Dublin, but the following year Dermot died and Richard was crowned King of Leinster. It was at this point that Henry II decided to intervene, and they quickly came to a friendly agreement. Richard would maintain control over Leinster, but as a fief, and thus began the conquest of Ireland, which would last until 1600. Your island? You mean Ireland? Yeah, it's mine. In 1170, Henry's son, Henry the Young King, was crowned as co-ruler. In theory, this should have been done by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but that was Henry's old rival Becket, and so instead, they had the Archbishop of York do it. As you can imagine, this just added more fuel to the fire of the ongoing conflict. After constant protesting by Becket, Pope Alexander III finally intervened and threatened with an interdict of all England as punishment. What the hell is an interdict, you ask? Well, simply put, it's a prohibition to conduct any of the church's rites and services. No mass, no weddings, communions or funerals. Faced with this situation, Henry II said to Becket, Tommy, old boy, why don't you come back to England so we can have a friendly chat? And so Becket did return, but not in the spirit that Henry was hoping, because he swiftly excommunicated several bishops who had sided with the king against him. By this point, Henry was well and truly fed up, so he cried out something along the lines of, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And this comment was immediately acted upon by four knights who sought to curry royal favour. They took it literally and went over to Canterbury where they ended up killing Thomas Becket, hacking him to pieces right in the middle of Canterbury Cathedral, no less. Lovely. Are you insane? Unsurprisingly, the Archbishop's murder shocked all of Christendom. Becket was canonised and became a symbol of the Church's independence against states, while the King had to give up on his aspirations of controlling the Church of England and subject to a public penance. Remember how we said that the ecclesiastical courts seldom resorted to physical punishment? Well, in this case they made a big exception because the king was whipped with a rod five times by each bishop of Canterbury and three times by each monk. It is thought that there were about 80 monks in total, so the king probably didn't sit comfortably on his throne or anywhere else for quite a while. In addition, in 1172, Henry had to sign the Compromise of Avranches, which diluted the constitutions of Clarendon and allowed the church to maintain its own courts. One of the most famous prelates at this time was Hubert Walter, the papal legate in England, who would later become archbishop and play a role in foreign policy, but we'll come to that later. After all this excitement, one would assume that Henry's life would be more peaceful, but nothing could be further from the truth, as his biggest challenge still lay ahead. It began in 1173 and is known as the Great Revolt, when his wife and children all turned against him. The main reason behind this was greed. What a surprise. You see, the way the succession was set up was that the firstborn son, Henry the Young King, would inherit England, Normandy and Anjou. Geoffrey would have Brittany, Richard, who was Eleanor's favourite son, would keep Aquitaine, and finally John would have no territories, hence his nickname John Lackland or Johnny Noland. 
However, because Henry the Young King couldn't wait to start enjoying all the power and riches, he began to resent his dad, who at the same time favoured his favourite son John by giving him the castles of Chinon, Loudon and Merbeau in France. That made Henry Jr. so jealous that he sought the aid of the French King Louis VII and began the Great Revolt after ensuring the support of his mother and his brothers, Richard and Geoffrey. When the situation began to heat up, Eleanor tried to run away dressed up as a man in an attempt to join her children in Paris, but she was caught and King Henry had her imprisoned at different castles for the following 16 years. Another king who tried to join this party was William I of Scotland, but he was quickly defeated and captured at the Battle of Annick in 1174. If you watched our previous episode on the Norman dynasty, you may recall that there had already been a Battle of Annick, where another Scottish king, Malcolm III, had also been defeated. In order to be freed, William of Scotland had to sign the Treaty of Falaise, which officially made Scotland an English vassal state. This lasted for 15 years, until Richard I had to sell it back in order to finance his participation in the Third Crusade. After 18 months of intense fighting, Henry II was able to defeat the rebels helping his children, and the conflict ended with the Peace of Mont-Louis, signed in 1174. This made it perfectly clear that Henry II was a strong and decisive king, but in a magnanimous gesture, he forgave his rebellious sons. Mind you, he still had all the barons who had plotted against him publicly executed, and that's the upside of being a Nepo baby. Later, Richard was made Duke of Aquitaine and gradually acquired a reputation as a fearless warrior, particularly during the siege of Taillebourg Castle in 1178. Moreover, Geoffrey became Duke of Brittany and John was appointed Lord of Ireland, while young Henry, who was still the king's heir, cooled down by travelling throughout Europe and spending his time at tournaments which were kind of like the music festivals of the Middle Ages. This lasted until 1182, when young Henry's ambition flared up once again and he demanded more power from his father. The king refused to give him new territory and instead conceded that Richard and Geoffrey would give homage to young Henry for their lands. But Richard didn't like this new arrangement and this set off a feud between the siblings. However, this conflict didn't last very long as young Henry fell sick and died soon after. Now, Richard became the heir to the English throne, while John would be Duke of Aquitaine. Geoffrey continued to hold Brittany, but he wouldn't enjoy it for very long, as he was trampled to death during a tournament a few years later, and was then replaced by his son Arthur. Remember him, because he will play a role in later events. Richard and his father had a terrible relationship, and it seemed that Richard, instigated by his mother, had even made plans to dethrone Henry with the help of the new French king, Philip II Augustus. But in the end, it wasn't necessary. As in the previous family conflict, disease resolved the situation and Henry II died in 1189. It is said that, while convalescent, his heart finally gave out when he discovered that his favourite son John had sided with Richard against him. You can't handle the truth! Just like our hearts will give out if you don't subscribe and like and comment and share. After Henry's death, Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart, inherited his father's extensive kingdom. The story says that, on the day of his coronation at Westminster Abbey, some groups of Jewish people who had brought gifts for the new king, despite being banned from attending the ceremony, were assaulted and beaten. This is quite likely because they were widely discriminated against, allegedly because of the high interest they charged when lending money, a trade that Jewish people specialised in since Christian religion forbade it. Sadly, these attacks began to spread throughout the country, with one particularly terrible case taking place in York, where a large group of them who were being attacked by a mob of bullies and bigots sought refuge in the wooden tower of a fortification. The assailants then set fire to the tower, and all the Jews burned to death or died trying to escape. It seemed that Richard tried to keep the peace, but there certainly weren't many punishments dealt out. Part of the reason why Richard I wanted peace in England was because he was about to leave the country for a long time. It was the year 1190, and every European noble worth his salt was set to travel to the Holy Land in order to fight Saladin, who had conquered Jerusalem some time earlier. In retaliation, Christendom organised the Third Crusade, also known as the King's Crusade, because, in addition to Richard, several other monarchs also took part, including the King of France, Philip Augustus. Unfortunately for English commoners, in order to finance the expedition, Richard raised taxes considerably, which never makes for a very popular ruler. 
King Richard appointed two regents during his absence, Hugh de Pousset, Bishop of Durham, and William de Mandeville, Earl of Essex, although the latter died soon afterwards and was replaced by William Longchamp. He also had this setup supervised by his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. However, Richard's brother, John Lackland, did not appreciate being overlooked, and so he began to conspire with the King of France, seeking to gain the throne. This led to some minor skirmishes, but nothing that changed the status quo. On his way to the Crusade, specifically in Sicily, Richard's mother introduced him to the Princess Berengaria of Navarre, daughter of King Sancho VI, and he decided to take her along with him on the Crusade. Not my first choice for a date, to be honest, but it worked out for him. Richard then conquered Cyprus from the Byzantines, and it seems that this conquest also conquered the heart of Berengaria, and they were married right there and then. It may sound very passionate and romantic, but Richard was still a pragmatic guy and money was tight, so he later sold the island to the Knights Templar. Eventually, Richard arrived at the Holy Land, started fighting against Saladin, and in a very short time, he had managed to reclaim the city of Acre. The story goes that, despite being feverish and unwell at the time of the siege, Richard still managed to participate by shooting arrows from his stretcher. Once in control of Acre, he occupied the royal palace and removed the banner of Duke Leopold of Austria, who had also taken part in the conquest, arguing that a duke could not be of equal standing to a king. However, as we will see, he would later come to regret this. And he could be trouble down the line. As the crusade dragged on, the French king decided to return home, but Richard was enjoying himself, and so he stayed for a while. He sieged the city of Jaffa and managed to conquer that as well. It is told that, on one occasion, he had nearly 3,000 Muslim prisoners executed because Saladin was late in paying their ransom. It's a bit harsh if you ask me. Richard won several battles against the Ayyubids, but he was never able to retake Jerusalem. Nevertheless, the courage he displayed during these encounters earned him the name Lionheart, which, to be fair, is pretty damn cool. That is the <laughs> best poor name I've ever heard, man! In 1192, Richard and Saladin agreed a truce. This was partly because the king wanted to return to England in order to stop the machinations of his brother John, who had gained London support and managed to become regent. However, Richard faced quite an odyssey in returning home. First, his ship ran aground near Aquileia in Italy, and so he had to continue the journey overland through the Holy Roman Empire. In order to avoid trouble, the company pretended to be pilgrims, but they were eventually recognised at an inn near Vienna, and Richard was captured and brought in front of his old friend Duke Leopold of Austria. The Duke then accused Richard of being involved in the death of his cousin, Conrad of Montferrat, during the Crusade in order to prevent him from becoming King of Jerusalem. And yeah, he was still bitter from having had his banner removed in Acre. You people are so petty. As it was, Richard spent several months imprisoned at Dernstein Castle until the situation reached the ears of Pope Celestine III, who then excommunicated Leopold because, you know, imprisoning epic crusaders was kind of frowned upon. That forced Leopold to let go of Richard, but he wasn't about to give up on his revenge. Instead of setting the Lionheart free, he handed him over to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI, who proceeded to imprison him at Trefels Castle for two years. And why did he do this? Well, because the king had previously supported his political rival, Duke Henry the Lion, who was married to Richard's sister, Matilda. The emperor was also excommunicated, but he didn't give a sheep's hoof about that, and instead demanded a ransom of £100,000 of silver from Richard's mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. In case you're wondering, that's a lot of silver, about 35 tonnes. Anyway, after all these mishaps, Richard finally made it back to England in 1194. He was received as a hero, and that made him feel magnanimous, so he forgave his brother John and appointed him his heir. However, his magnanimity didn't extend to the French king, Philip Augustus, who had conquered parts of Normandy in the king's absence. Richard requested support from his father-in-law, Sancho VI, and after several encounters, like the Battle of Fresival in 1194, he reclaimed most of the territories and pushed back the French king. But unfortunately for Richard, this campaign would be his last. In 1199, during the siege of the castle of chalus chevrol while he was taking a defiant walk in front of the walls, a boy sought to take revenge for the death of his family and shot him with a crossbow. He hit Richard in the shoulder, the wound turned gangrenous and eventually caused the king's death. Some stories say that Richard's last act before dying was to forgive the child and even give him some money. But to be fair, other sources say that the boy was flayed alive, so take your pick. England had a new king, 
John I, also known as John Lackland, who has gone down in history as the worst Plantagenet monarch because he made several poor decisions. Mind you, the country was always going through a fair bit of trouble. The first problem came from Arthur of Brittany, son of John's brother Geoffrey, who thought the crown would look far better on his head, and so a battle for power broke out between them. The English supported John, while the French sided with Arthur. Then, in 1202, John conducted a surprise attack on Mirabeau Castle, where the French king, Philip Augustus, held his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, as a hostage. He captured 200 enemy knights, and also his nephew Arthur, whom he held captive for a while until one day, while drunk, he executed him personally, then tied a rock to the corpse and threw it in a river. <laughs> This led several nobles to remove their support and allow Philip Augustus to conquer Normandy, Anjou and Maine. Faced with this setback, in 1203 John fled Rouen for England, the only territory he managed to retain, along with a small part of Aquitaine that came to be known as Gascony, although later, upon the death of his mother Eleanor, the rest was all conquered away from him. This defeat led many to view John as a weak king, and so he spent the rest of his reign attempting to reclaim the duchy, albeit with no success. Instead, John ruled from England, but since he was deprived of his considerable Norman income, he had to raise taxes to finance his military campaigns. Double the taxes, triple the taxes, squeeze every last drop! Even reaching the point of inventing new taxes, which predictably didn't go down well with the population. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter, and one of the most influential noblemen in the kingdom, William Marshall, advised him to forget about the invasion because it was a hopeless cause. It took a while, but they eventually managed to persuade him to focus on England, and then he began to travel throughout the land, accompanied by his entourage of course, solving litigations and that kind of thing. In 1205, he wanted to appoint his ally, John de Grey, as Archbishop of Canterbury, but the clerical council selected a guy named Reginald instead who quickly travelled to Rome in order to be confirmed by Pope Innocent III. But then the Pope said that he didn't like either candidate, and instead chose Cardinal Stephen Langton. John threw a tantrum and refused him entry into England, and so the Pope placed an interdict on England in 1208. King John told him where he could stick his interdict, and was then excommunicated, to which he responded by confiscating a lot of the church's property and income. Eventually, after five years, they made up. John subjected to Rome and accepted Langton as Archbishop. He would later play an important role during the most significant political reform in many centuries, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Right around that time, a certain bandit named Robert Hodd took refuge in the woods surrounding the city of York. It is thought that he gave rise to the myth of Robin Hood, the outlaw who lived in Sherwood Forest and stole from the rich to give to the poor. But then we have another fugitive from almost a century later who may also have inspired the various tales about this famous character. Regardless of his true origin, Robin Hood's rise in popularity came with Sir Walter Scott's 1819 novel, Ivanhoe. To Ivanhoe! While all this was going on, the small kingdoms of Wales were being threatened by English expansion. That is, until the arrival of Llewellyn the Great, King of Gwynedd, who, through a combination of war and diplomacy, secured the loyalty of several Welsh lords and proclaimed himself as the first Prince of Wales at the Council of Aberdiffy in 1216. For his part, John Lackland still sought to reclaim his Angevin territories, and so he allied with several powerful rulers, Otto IV of the Holy Roman Empire, Count Ferdinand of Flanders, and a few others. The coalition fought Philip Augustus at the Battle of Bouvines in 1214, where the French prevailed. And this was quite a catastrophe for John, to the point that it is considered as the end of the Angevin Empire, since the subsequent Treaty of Chinon meant that he lost most of his French territories forever. I've lost everything I loved. With his popularity at an all-time low, several barons of the English North, headed by Robert Fitzwalter, rebelled against the king, calling themselves the Army of God. They marched on London and took the city, whereupon King John caved in and accepted to hold peace talks at Windsor Castle. On the 15th of June 1215, and with the mediation of Archbishop Langton, the king and barons drafted the super-famous Magna Carta, a political reform that removed some of the king's powers and gave more rights to freemen, especially the nobles and clergy. In addition, the document also included a limitation of taxes, more agile justice, ecclesiastical rights, and protection against illegal imprisonment and expropriation of land. Moreover, it established a council of 25 barons who would supervise its enforcement. 
Now, all of this sounded great in theory, but John didn't have any real intention of actually complying with Magna Carta, and instead petitioned Pope Innocent III to annul it. The Pope agreed to John's request, and that led to the First Baron's War, where the rebels began by taking Rochester Castle, while others rose in arms in the north, supported by the King of Scotland, Alexander II. Throughout the years, John had managed to save a considerable fortune, and so he could afford a decent army, which he now used to reconquer Rochester, as we can see in the film Ironclad. After that, John sieged Dover Castle and reclaimed the city, and later attacked the Northern Territories, kicking out Alexander II. It appeared as if things were finally going well for John, but alas, this was just a short reprieve before the final act. The end began in 1216, as the son of the French King Philip Augustus, Prince Louis, disembarked at Kent and, with the support of the rebels, claimed the English throne by virtue of being married to a granddaughter of Henry II. John set out to fight Prince Louis and his faction, but then a violent storm destroyed most of the English fleet, weakening his position. Finally, King John contracted dysentery and began to waste away until he ended up dying at Newark Castle in Nottinghamshire in 1216. Unfortunately for England, that didn't put an end to the Civil War. After John's death, the royal army supported his son, Henry, even though he was just nine years old, fighting in his name at the battles of Lincoln and Sandwich, both of which they won in 1217. This gave victory to the Royalists, who kicked Prince Louis back to France and crowned Henry as the new King of England. Henry III, also known as Henry of Winchester, ruled England for the next 56 years, the longest reign in its history so far, and not surpassed until the 19th century. Very impressive! The first item on the new King's agenda was to put an end to the Baron's War, so in 1217 he signed the Magna Carta, and that made everyone happy. Well, he didn't actually sign it himself because he was still a child. Instead, it was his regent, the elderly William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke. With that, many of the rebel barons agreed to return the lands and castles they had taken during the Civil War, and so by 1227, Henry was able to formally assume his position as King of England. Long live the King. The king's most famous advisor was Hubert de Burr, and Henry III placed so much trust in him that he appointed him Earl of Kent. However, in 1232, Hubert lost the royal favour when his rival, Peter de Rochus, accused him of poisoning people and embezzling public money. The king imprisoned Hubert at the Tower of London, and Peter was rewarded with a good position in government. But all of this went to Peter's head, and he soon started taking over other nobles' lands. Those nobles protested, and in 1233 rose up against him led by Richard, the son of William Marshall. After things got too heated and Richard died in a battle, the Archbishop of Canterbury had to intervene to put peace between both sides. Things got heated, words were exchanged. A few years later, in 1236, Henry III married Eleanor of Provence, who would later give him a son and heir, Edward Longshanks, as well as another boy, Edmund Crouchback, and three girls. Around this time, they began to build massive cathedrals in the Gothic style, such as Salisbury Cathedral, Exeter Cathedral, Wells Cathedral and Lincoln Cathedral. And then there was Canterbury Cathedral, which had burned down, so they took the opportunity to rebuild it in the Gothic style. And we should also mention the new Westminster Abbey, where English monarchs are crowned and buried. It was located next to Westminster Palace, and nowadays that's where we can find the British Parliament or what passes for it. Behave yourself! Be a good boy, young man! Be a good boy! In 1254, Pope Innocent IV offered Henry III the throne of the Kingdom of Sicily, and he decided to turn it over to his son Edmund. There was just one small detail left to sort out, and that was the fact that the Pope didn't actually hold the throne, so Sicily had to be conquered first, but doing so required a load of money, almost to the point of bankrupting England. And just like on previous occasions when the King demanded too much cash from them, the barons began to grumble. That led the King to assemble the nobles in Westminster in 1258 in order to discuss the collection of taxes to finance his Sicilian campaign. Unsurprisingly, the nobles totally opposed this idea and accused Henry of not respecting the Magna Carta. For this reason, seven of the most influential barons forced the king to accept the provisions of Oxford, 
This was significant because it meant that the king ceded part of his power to a council of nobles and clergymen who would have the last word in terms of taxes and appointments. The council would meet at what became known as a parliament, initially at Oxford, but they later moved to Westminster. The most relevant figure in this council was Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester and also brother-in-law to the king. De Montfort brought about the lowest point for Henry in 1259 with the Treaty of Paris. Through it, the barons forced Henry III to renounce his rights over most of his grandfather's inheritance, that is, the Angevin Empire. But as a small compensation, the French King Louis IX, or Louis the Saint, recognised him as ruler of Gascony. Thanks, Louis. Naturally, Henry didn't like this at all, so in 1262, he persuaded the Pope to declare null and void the provisions of Oxford. This in turn caused Simon de Montfort to rebel, and he managed to take the city of London, kicking off the Second Barons' War. Simon began his campaign with several victories, which gave him control over most of the southeast of England. At one of those encounters, the Battle of Lewis, the king and his son Edward were captured by the rebels, along with Henry's brother, Richard of Cornwall, King of the Romans, which was the title used by the King of Germany back then. When he saw their side being crushed, Richard had tried to hide in a windmill, but the barons found him and forced him out among taunts and mockery. <laughs> With Henry in his power, Simon de Montfort placed himself at the head of the government, under the title of Seneschal, even though he was de facto King of England. He convened Parliament without royal authorisation, and included in it several rich and influential citizens, as well as two knights from each county. However, many nobles were not convinced by this new arrangement, since they viewed Simon as a fanatic and arrogant reformer. On the other hand, many historians consider his role essential in the creation of the future House of Commons. But England's monarchic rule was not quite over yet as Prince Edward managed to escape from his imprisonment at Hereford Castle and put together a large army. He then fought de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham in 1265, where the rebels were completely massacred. Simon de Montfort was killed, and Edward made an example of him, medieval style, by having his head, hands and feet cut off, and then his testicles hung around his nose. His what?! Despite now being leaderless, the rebellion continued for a couple more years, until the rebels were definitively defeated at Kenilworth Castle, which was followed by the destruction of the last rebel holdout at the Isle of Ely in 1267. Afterwards, the Statute of Marlborough was proclaimed, re-establishing much, although not all, of the King's authority. It seems that all this action gave Prince Edward a taste for battle, and so he decided to join the Ninth Crusade in 1270. He nearly lost his life at the hands of a member of the Syrian Order of Assassins, but he survived and, on his way back home in 1272, he found out about his father's death. Thus, as soon as he returned to England, he was crowned king, the first fully English monarch in over 200 years since he had been born and raised entirely in the country, had a proper English name and spoke the language fluently. It had certainly taken a while. I know, it's, it's hard to believe. Now that the Plantagenet dynasty had lost most of their continental possessions, they focused their ambition on the British Isles. Things were about to turn rough, with plenty of violence, destruction and suffering, as we will see in the next episode. And the rest is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us a big like. Take care and I'll see you in the next video. Ranulf de Glanville drafted the Treaty of is it treatsy? Treatis. Okay, sorry. And threatened with an interdict, inter, inter, interdict, interdict, and threatened with an interdict of. So close. However, his magnum. That's hard. Magna. Magnamit. Magna. Magnamit. Magnanim. Introduced him to the Princess Berengaria of Navarre. Navarre? Ah, fuck. I mean. Oh dear.